Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Anthony Moreno. Welcome to the 17th season of Your Legislators right here on KRWG Public Media. On this program, we feature in-depth conversations with state lawmakers while they work in Santa Fe during legislative sessions in New Mexico. Joining us for the first program of the year is Democratic State Senator Bill Souls, who has served in the Senate since 2013 and chairs the Senate Education Committee. Senator Souls, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's very nice being here with you. We have a 60 day legislative session. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this session, the start of it. What are your thoughts as, as we begin this session? Well, you know, every time I've been, this will be my 11th legislative session and every session seems to have a personality. Uh, still not sure what this session's personality is gonna be. We've had some that were rather schizophrenic, some that were very calm and smooth, uh, others that felt like a race from the very beginning. And so we'll see what this personality turns out to be. As people realize we've got record new revenues coming in, which means there's a lot of, of at least non-recurring money, one-time money to spend moving New Mexico forward, but that also means there will be lots and lots of bills introduced, lots of ideas about how to use that money and how to spend that money and sometimes that means it's uh, fighting with your friends more. Uh, probably the smoothest session I've been in was the one where there was no money because there was nothing to fight about. And so we all kind of went up there, we did our job and moved things forward, but there, there wasn't a whole lot of things to move New Mexico forward. We've got tremendous opportunities with this session. A tremendous opportunities. You mentioned the record breaking uh, revenue available. The governor has presented her proposed budget for the legislative session. Obviously, putting together a budget, a big part of the legislative session. The governor proposed a $9.4 billion budget. That's nearly uh, a 12 percent increase from last fiscal year. Your thoughts on the governor's budget and how it aligns with the Democratic majority in the Senate? Uh, and I think it's much bigger than a 12 percent. The numbers I've been hearing is it's somewhere around 40 percent increase over last year. And last year was somewhere around 20% increase over the prior year. We are seeing record new revenue, $3.4 billion in new money this year are the numbers that I've been hearing. And so, you know, there is flush with money, how to spend that, how to make targeted investments in a, different, in a future for New Mexico is really what this session is going to be about. Now, I'd like to talk with you about education. Obviously, you have a background as an educator in New Mexico for many years. Uh, one of the big spending items uh, in the governor's proposed budget is $220 million for extended in-classroom learning time. How important is that extended in-classroom learning time? Can you kind of give us an understanding of what that really means and uh, how that translates to the classroom in New Mexico? Yes, and, and you mentioned that the governor's budget, and there are several competing budgets when we get up here. The governor's is one of them. The legislature has a budget, and the whole session is about how do we meld those two together? Where do we agree? Where are their differences? Uh, and try and work out some of those. And so the extended learning time, we know that the more time that children spend in high quality education with teachers, the better the outcomes. Uh, in the past, we haven't had enough money to extend the school year. We have enough money to do that. And so this really is about making sure that that extra time is quality instruction time, not watching a movie, not watching other things that are not quality instruction. And, and that's where some of the discussions really will be is how do we, we use that effectively? And also, how do we get all of the districts to buy in? Uh, we know from past education experiences that if we mandate to the districts that they, you have to do this in education, that it usually doesn't turn out so well. Districts have different ideas. And so it's a bit more about us appropriating the money to the districts for extending the school year. And then the local school boards, the local superintendents working on how to effectively use that money towards the local needs 
in their education programs. Uh, we know Albuquerque, Las Cruces, as the two largest districts, have very different needs than if you go to Roy or Mosquero or some of the micro districts, their learning needs are going to be very different. And if we try and put a one size fits all from Santa Fe, there's going to be resistance and the money will not be as well spent. Let's dive into that a little bit more because you, you mentioned something that I think is really important for our audience to understand. And a lot of folks here may be watching in rural communities. Once you get outside of Albuquerque, Las Cruces and other larger cities in New Mexico, things get really rural very quick. And a lot of these rural school districts, you have teachers that may be doing multiple roles at, at, at their school. They may be driving a bus. They may be uh, volunteering uh, in other areas. They may be a coach. Uh, or a, a, you know another uh, mentor in in within the district. So I'd like to kind of hear your thoughts. How do you bridge that gap between the needs of rural communities and the needs of the bigger school districts? And and thank you because that's a real nuance that a lot of people don't get. Is and as the chair of education, I'm not there just representing the Las Cruces public schools and the needs in Las Cruces. I've got a much broader role of providing for the education needs of all the children in the state and making sure that they're met. We have programs or the, the hierarchy is the state appropriates money and does broad educational legislation and laws, but we really leave it up to the local school district, the superintendent, the school boards to make those decisions that work best for their district. And so it really is a partnership all across the state between the state monies and the local districts to provide education for our children. We don't have just one unilateral district and certainly the needs in a state as big and varied as New Mexico are incredibly different in the dis different districts. Now, another issue that um, is, is being talked about being addressed within the budget is providing meals for students in New Mexico, healthy meals uh, across the board. Can you kind of give us an understanding of why this is needed in New Mexico. I know our audience has heard this many times during our interviews about us being one of the poorest states in the country, but how big of a need is this to provide those healthy nutrition, nutritious meals for students? And New Mexico has some of the, as you indicated, some of the highest poverty rates in the country. Uh, I can best relate it when I was a principal at Conley Elementary here in Las Cruz or in Las Cruces. I had some students at my school that the last time they had a healthy meal was Friday at lunch and they came in Monday morning famished because the parents and the family just did not have the resources to provide healthy meals through the rest of the, the day. We have a number of students that qualify for free breakfast or free lunch. Uh, my particular district or district, my particular school, Conley Elementary, about 80% of the students qualified for free and reduced lunch and only about 20% were full pay students. The state has now proposed that instead of doing that, that we just see that having students fed and having good nutrition is part of a good education. And rather than having any of the stigma of some who pay and some don't, that we're just going to cover the meals at school, breakfast and lunch for all students in New Mexico. And it just makes sense. Uh, as a classroom teacher, I know if I've got a student who is did not eat well for breakfast or is not getting the nutrition they need, their ability to learn and to concentrate in class is diminished compared to the other students. And if we wanna make a difference, let's just take that off the table. I don't think there are very many people who would disagree that all children ought to have access to healthy food. And so we've got the money with this new budget. Let's just do that. Another key component uh, in learning in 2023 is having access to high-speed internet broadband. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, where do you think that's going to fall within this budget? And do you think the state is doing enough to allocate resources to meet the needs for students in New Mexico when it comes to high-speed internet? Some of the things that we found through the pandemic was it really laid bare how inadequate the internet access was across the state. Uh, out on the Navajo reservation, for instance, a number of the families have no electricity. And so their ability to access internet was severely compromised. We also have some, some, some major challenges with the ruralness of the state, with the mountainous areas of getting hardwired to all of the different areas. 
we have some new leadership in the area of broadband within the state that really is looking at how do we put an umbrella over the entire state so that everyone has access. And it's not just access for our school children, but small businesses more and more are working remotely from home. And you have to have high speed internet in order to do that. And the fact that New Mexico doesn't have access across the state is an economic anchor to the, the economics, to the business, to the prosperity of our entire state. And so I'm hoping, and with the federal infrastructure money, lots of which is earmarked for broadband, that we're able to finally get New Mexico into the modern age. I drive to Santa Fe all the time, and I know almost to the mile marker where it's gonna drop my phone calls. That's on the main corridor through this state, and we still don't have access everywhere on that main corridor. We need to fix that. There's the technology to do that. There's still discussion about whether to do it with hardwire, whether to do it with one of the, the Sky blimps. I think it's Sky is the actual company to provide that, whether to do it with satellites or and all of the above, depending on the, the location. But we certainly have the, the ability to do that now. And with the federal money coupled with state money, that I hope we finally get it done instead of just talking about having broadband for all. It's no longer a, a luxury, it's a necessity like electricity and running water. One of the things that New Mexico struggled with during the pandemic was having enough educators. The National Guard had to become had to be called in to uh, fill uh, classrooms in the state. Now there's been proposals set forth to improve salaries for all school personnel. I know that there's discussions about that happening in Santa Fe during this legislative session. Where do you stand on this issue and where do you think it needs to be so that New Mexico school districts can retain teachers and also recruit teachers as well? It's already happening. Uh, in the last legislative session last year, we put in record amounts of money into salary increases for teachers. We raised the minimums. New Mexico has a three tier system where beginning teachers at a level one have a minimum starting salary of $50,000. Level two for teachers that have gone through the, the first couple of years, got some experience, move up to a level two with some expectations. Uh, but that minimum salary is 60,000 and level three teachers, which are more in the teacher leadership roles, have a minimum salary of 70,000. And by the way, that's before any of the extended school year things that we talked about before. Those all are in addition at that same daily rate. So we'll have many of our teachers in the Las Cruces district that'll be making well over $80,000 a year. The, as a result of doing that, New Mexico's teacher salaries are now the highest in the region. It used to be that we would train teachers at New Mexico State University, for instance, and then they would go and work in Texas for more money. They'd go to Arizona or California for more money or Colorado. We now have the highest salaries in the region, and so they're staying here. Uh, some of the numbers that I've heard is prior to this last year, there were over 600 classrooms in New Mexico that did not have a full-time qualified teacher. They were being filled by substitutes, or on some days the students were down in the cafeteria because there was no teacher. We have cut that in half as a result of those salary increases last year. And we are seeing a record number of applications from other states coming in. And so those numbers are continuing to drop. And I tell people, we're not done. Uh, the salaries last year were targeted on teachers, but there's a lot of educators in our public schools that are not in the licensed teacher area, but also serve our children and their needs. And we're working on increasing all of their salaries. We have moved up to where the public schools will have a minimum salary for any worker of $15 an hour, well above the state's minimum wage. And so that's cafeteria workers, custodians, uh, EAs, all of those will fall under some of that category and we're not done. We plan on having some additional increases in salary this year, some to offset. We all have been feeling the inflationary pressures around the country, but to offset the decline in buying power from those salaries we gave last year is to maintain some of that buying power so that they aren't losing that. Uh, the governor also put out a proposal and we're in the process of evaluating it, but to pay all of the healthcare costs for educators in New Mexico. 
that's a big a big uh, increase to salaries when the healthcare costs have been going up where that's not gonna eat a chunk out of their pay. So it's effectively an additional pay raise. And so New Mexico has made a commitment that if we're going to move up from the bottom of the education rankings, we need to make sure we're making those targeted investments in high quality teachers for every classroom. And it's starting to pay off. We've got a long way to go. Okay, there's other topics I want to discuss with you, but before we end with education, I have to talk about early childhood education. Of course, New Mexico has ranked low when it comes to child well-being in the state. Early childhood education uh, has been a big concern for a lot of folks in the state. There's been some targeted investments made to this. New Mexico voters went to the polls and approved a constitutional amendment in the midterm elections that changes the funding uh, with early childhood education and I'd like to get your thoughts on this and where the challenge lies now that the voters have already done their part and approved this this new funding mechanism so where does the challenge lie now with the legislature to make sure that this money is getting to the kids that need it and, and that, again another great topic uh, New Mexico is actually getting lots of uh, press around the country for having a secretary of early childhood care and education, uh, for the investments that we've made for being the first state in the country to, through our constitution, provide funding for early childhood education. Other states are asking, how did you do that? How's it going to work? Uh, my concern is now those monies haven't started flowing yet. They, it's still about a year off before those monies will start showing up in the budgets. But this year we'll do some of the discussion about how those go, where does that particular money go? My concern is that we don't just supplant the investments we're already making in early childhood education with those monies and then pull that money out other places. I remind people that the voters expect that the investments we're already making in early childhood education are supplemented by this new money, not supplanted by this money. And so that's one of the areas I'll be paying close attention that these, this really is on top of the money we have already been spending on our very youngest children. We know that if we make investments in our youngest children, it pays off in their education for the rest of their lives. Uh, because of those investments, I expect that we are going to start moving up from the bottom rankings on child well-being on the NE Casey, I think is this, the study most people respond to. Uh, I hate it. Every time I hear that, it's like a punch to the gut when I hear we're still 49th or 50th, and it just reinforces that we've got lots more to do. But I think we're making the right investments, and it's gonna take a while. Remember, we're investing in one, two, and three-year-olds, and if we're looking at their education outcomes as a high school senior, that's a decade or more away. And so it's going to take a while, but I think we're making the right investments. Okay, uh, you were referring to the Kids Count Data Book from the Annie Casey Foundation with that study yes. in New Mexico's rankings. I wanna move on and talk about public safety in New Mexico, a big conversation in last year's election. I'd like to hear from you. What do you think uh, the Senate can get accomplished in addressing public safety in New Mexico? In some of our caucus meetings, we've had some discussion. There are going to be a number of bills uh, dealing with gun violence. A uh, number of them were precipitated by the awful events down in Uvalde, Texas last year. I have three gun control bills of my own, and I know there are four or five other legislators that also have bills, and that's just on the Senate side. I suspect there'll be similar ones coming out of the House as people are just so frustrated with that public safety issue. And it really is a public health issue of the having so many guns out in the community. Uh, nationally, we know just in the last couple of weeks of the six-year-old who shot his teacher at school, how a six-year-old ever has access to a handgun in this country baffles me. But we've got to do something about that. Uh, the particular bills that I'm carrying are ones to ban assault weapons, ban high-capacity magazines, and then also an appropriation of $2 million to have a buyback program for assault weapons. Uh, if they, if the buyback were $500 for each assault style weapon, we're talking about taking, I think that works out to 4,000 of them off the streets of New Mexico. There are a number of the other bills raising the minimum age to buy an assault style weapon to 21, uh, safe storage 
bills, a number of ones just dealing with the gun control issue. The governor in her budget has put out, uh, and I'm trying to remember the number, I think the number is somewhere around 30, 40 million dollars to increase the number of law enforcement on the streets get more of them through the academy, increase pay for retention, and hire more officers on the streets. Lots of that precipitated by the terrible events in Albuquerque. But we also, in all of the, at least the larger communities around New Mexico, are also seeing some increase in violent crime. And associated with all of that is rebuilding and continue to reinforce our behavioral health care programs across the state so that people that are feeling lost, traumatized, have a, a mechanism other than lashing out at others. So, and so all of those are very deeply engaged and involved with each other. Now you brought up behavioral health. Let's let's talk about that. Um, you know, what are the steps you think the state is going to take during this legislative session to address the behavioral <coughs> health needs that exist in New Mexico? I'm not on those particular committees or those interims through the interim session. So I don't have as much direct knowledge of particular bills that are going to be introduced. I know there is discussion about working to ensure that behavioral health care is seen as regular health care and is covered by insurance companies. I know that's one area where there have been concerns. Certainly we've got a, a serious problem with having enough counselors, psychologists to deal with the behavioral health problems and issues. I am carrying a bill to expand the, the scope of practice, if you will, for prescribing psychologists, uh, that they are able to prescribe in appropriate situations. They are fully trained, but to prescribe psychotropic drugs for people that are having psychotic events and other kinds of things so that they don't escalate and get worse. Uh, New Mexico has been a leader from the very get-go on that in allowing prescribing psychologists. And this just increases the number of behavioral health professionals that are available and accessible for New Mexicans. Okay, I wanna move on and talk about another issue, economic development, obviously a, a big concern for many in New Mexico, trying to uh, grow the economy here. Uh, what are some things that you're working on that you think can address this? It almost looks like you've been reading through my uh, pre-filed bills and stuff on all of these things. Uh, one of the main areas I'm working on, lots of our state budget is based on the extractive industries and particularly oil and gas. Right now, we are seeing huge windfalls as a result of that. But we know in 10 years or so, that is going to be dropping off worldwide as renewable energy picks up more and more of the energy load. And New Mexico has to look at investments to diversify our economy, to move away from a straight oil and gas economy. Some particular areas I'm working on deal with uh, research and innovation at our universities. It's got a very good return on investment that if we invest more money in both basic and applied research at the universities, that that spins off patents, it spins off entrepreneurs, small businesses, it brings in additional grant money. The research brings in approximately four to five additional dollars of outside research grants for every dollar the state invests in research. And so several bills I'm carrying are designed to increase the capacity of New Mexico to do that kind of research. I just today was having a conversation with some people about building the Rio Grande Research Corridor. Similar people that might be familiar with North Carolina's Research Triangle, yeah. but is to take advantage of Los Alamo National Laboratory, Sandia, UNM, New Mexico Tech, New Mexico State, White Sands Missile Range, and quite frankly, even though they're in Texas, is UTEP, but as part of that Rio Grande Research Corridor, where all of those groups are cooperating with each other and not competing for the same research grants, but trying to do larger um, types of grants where they work together. I see, I, I look forward to talking with you more about that, but we just have a couple of minutes left, just under two minutes. I, I'd like to hear more uh, from you. You made some news last year with a proposal about high speed rail in New Mexico. Can you share with us a little bit about your proposal and what you'll be working on? Sure. And, and it's interesting. That's the one everybody picks up on because anybody who's traveled other places in the world and ridden on the bullet trains on the high speed rail and by high speed rail, I'm talking about 150 mile an hour and up 
trains, not 80 mile an hour Amtrak. Um, but high speed rail across the world, countries are putting in more of it and no one is taking it out, except in the United States where there is no high speed rail that goes over 100 miles an hour anywhere in our country. And we have an opportunity in New Mexico because we still have lots of open land that we could start looking at putting in high speed rail. And I would love to see it to go from Chihuahua to Denver or beyond. That would require international cooperation, interstate cooperation, and certainly within New Mexico. I only control or can propose things for New Mexico. And so I've got a proposal both to fund it I have no illusions it's going that they're going to allocate a billion dollars to build just New Mexico's portion. It has to be bigger and broader than that. But also to do a study of what would the economic impacts be? And what I've heard from Dr. Peach, very noted uh, research, economic researcher at New Mexico State, is the economic return for the state over the next 20 years would be transformational, I think were the words that he used. Okay. And so we've got to look up and out. We've got to talk about doing these kinds of things. And remember, no one's taking them out. People are putting in more, except in the United States. We need to get on board, if you will. New Mexico Democratic State Senator William Soles. Bill, thank you for joining us on Your Legislators. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Anthony. That's it for this episode. Remember, you can always keep updated with the latest news at our website, kwg.org, and email us at feedback at nmsu.edu. I'm Anthony Morano. We'll see you next time.